Creative people are invariably intelligent people, and they're curious about themselves, those around them, and the world in which they live. This is the kind of curiosity that's been called one of the permanent and certain characteristics of a vigorous intellect. Questions are the creative acts of the intelligence, and the questions that work hardest for us and bring us the greatest amount of useful information are the open-ended questions. Now, these are questions that can't be answered with a simple yes or no. They're asked by using the six W's, H and I technique. Who, what, when, where, why, which, how, and if. Rudyard Kipling put it this way, I had six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were where and what and when, and why and how and who. All we're doing is adding two more, which and if. Now this isn't entirely new to us. We employed the six W's, H and I all the time when we were children. Have you ever tried to count the number of times each day a four or five year old uses the word why? You see, each question a child asks is an attempt to add to his limited knowledge. When adults lose patience with this constant barrage of questions, the child either finds some other way of getting the information or just forgets the whole thing, thereby neglecting a valuable tool he'll want later in life, the open-ended question. Now, as adults, we know that inside the mind of each person we meet, there is some knowledge that could benefit us if only we could learn what it is. The open-ended question technique really opens people up. By asking open-ended questions, we get people to remove the barriers that normally keep this information out of our grasp. Human beings like to talk about things that interest them. Open-ended questions let people know we want to hear their ideas, opinions, and thoughts. Each of us has two ears and one mouth, and it seems to be a good idea to do at least twice as much listening as talking. An old Texas friend of mine used to say, you ain't learning nothing while you're talking. But the object of asking open-ended questions isn't merely to get other people to talk. We could spend days standing around gabbing with people who have very little to say that would benefit us. Instead, the object of our who, what, when, where, why, which, how, and if questions is to gather, absorb, and utilize that information which will be useful to us, move us ahead in the fields of our own interests and endeavors. But in so doing, we're also employing the best technique known for making friends for success in human relations, and for selling our own ideas. Oddly enough, the more we listen, the better conversationalist we seem to the person doing the talking. One of this country's top newsmen set a good example of this kind of purposeful questioning. He knew how to ask open-ended questions so provocatively that he could almost always get world leaders to give him exclusive interviews. His wise questions earned him the highest position in his field, that of chief executive for one of the great news services. And the open-ended question is equally useful to the businessman. Suppose, for instance, that you've just met a Mr. Smith who's an official of a company operating in an area different from your own. Instead of talking about the weather, you might ask him, Mr. Smith, how did you get into your line of work? Now, here's a man who obviously has some degree of success in business, so you stand an excellent chance of learning something that will be useful to you. One of the best salesmen I know uses open-ended questions to great advantage when he's talking with a prospect. Instead of saying, we make the best thingamabob in the world, he asks, Mr. Prospect, when you buy thingamabobs, what features are most important to you? Now, here's an effective method for taking people off the offensive, for getting them to talk to your advantage. This technique works well for anyone who will give some thought to what he's going to say, rather than just blurting out the first thing that pops into his mind. So ask, skillfully, probing open-ended questions, and ask them in a sincere, courteous manner. Anyone who uses the six W's H and I technique wisely, courteously, and with those people who can contribute something to his understanding, will quickly find this to be one of his most useful creative techniques. The best way I know to practice asking open-ended questions is to try out a few on myself. If this sounds like a good idea, you might want to try it too. Ask yourself, who has a greater knowledge of my job than I? What can I do to learn some of the things he knows, but I don't? Why must my job be done this way? And if there is a better way to do my job, what would it be? The housewife and the student can make up a similar set of questions that will be just as stimulating in their own fields. Take time to ponder these questions. Their answers, the facts and information you will gain, can make your life infinitely more interesting and rewarding. And whenever you talk with others, use lots of open-ended questions. They're your most valuable creative tools. Thank you.
Let's work on your listening ability. It's important to know how well you understand and remember what you hear. Now here's a test which will help you judge how good a listener you are. I'm going to tell you about Socrates, a remarkable man. The story is adapted from one by Dr. Leo Rostin. When I'm finished, I'll ask you 12 questions about Socrates, so please listen carefully. Socrates lived more than 300 years before Christ. He was squat, pot-bellied, bald-headed. He never wore a shirt or underwear, nothing but a cloak. He was a merry fellow, never petty or unkind. He was brave, heroically serving as a hard-fighting foot soldier in four bitter battles. He was a philosopher and a talker. But most of all, he was an asker of questions. He constantly questioned men about their beliefs, and he was always asking why. He was brilliant, provocative, and profound. He was often called a crackpot and a corrupter, a meddlesome, sardonic prattler. He refused all money for his teachings. He denied that he could ever teach anyone anything. Rather, he said he could only make men think. Socrates sought truth, and he went after it relentlessly. He said, life unexamined is not worth living. Under the laws of Athens, he was voted guilty of impiety and treason. When he was condemned to death, he responded, I have refused to address you in the way which would have flattered you, repenting, weeping, throwing myself on your sympathy, saying things I consider unworthy. For I would rather die as a result of the defense I made than live as the result of the other. Nothing can harm a good man in life or in death. Now the hour of my departure has arrived and we go our ways. I to die and you to live. Which is better, God only knows. He spent his last hours discussing with undiminished delight the problems that had always intrigued him, good and evil, ethics and honor and duty, how the senses can deceive us, what ennobles man and what demeans him, how to test the truth of a proposition or prove a point or expose a lazy assumption or a pat conclusion. When his disciples saw the dignity with which he drank the cup of hemlock, they wept. The poison paralyzed his limbs and soon reached his heart. This frog-eyed, incorruptible man, this man who pestered everyone by asking why, how do you know, what is the evidence, this man who forced men to use their brains, this man who was obsessed with reason and driven by a passion for inquiry, this man who mocked hokum and annihilated platitudes, who fought ignorance and easy answers, this Socrates launched a revolution in human history. He dared enthrone reason above tradition. He taught men the marvelous victories that can be won by the free mind alone. He preached that honor lies not in obedience to authority, but in the fearless pursuit of truth, and in propagating the idea that truth is above politics and conscience beyond law. The finest in all of us, from St. Paul to Martin Luther to Einstein and Schweitzer, is descended from this ancient, noble Greek. The questions he raised dominated philosophy for 2,000 years. According to Dr. Rostin, the Socratic method of questioning and teaching has never been surpassed. And wherever men today pursue truth or are ready to die for intellectual freedom, wherever men assert the holy right to think, to argue, to challenge, to debate, in the conviction that life unexamined is indeed not worth living, they're following the example of that ugly saint who never wrote a word. His ideas were immortalized by Plato, who called him the bravest, wisest, most just man of all we know. Yes, Socrates was quite a man, a really creative genius, loved and hated, but never ignored. He made people think, and that's not always a popular thing to do. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, it's important to know how well we understand what we hear. In order to find out how good a listener you are, I'm going to ask you 12 questions about Socrates. All the answers are found in the story. Now, with your pencil and paper, jot down your answers to the following questions. Ready? Here are the questions. 1. When did Socrates live? 2. Describe his overall appearance. 3. What was his attitude toward life, merry or melancholy? Four, how many battles was he in? Five, what word did he use most in his questioning role in life? Six, 
What did his enemies often call him? 7. What was Socrates found guilty of? 8. What did Socrates say about life? 9. How did he die? 10. What writer did I quote in telling the Socrates story? 11. How much writing did Socrates do? And 12. What famous philosopher called Socrates the bravest, wisest, most just man of all we know? Here are the answers to those 12 questions about Socrates. See how many you had correct. Number one. Socrates lived more than 300 years before Christ. Two, Socrates was squat, pot-bellied, ball-headed, frog-eyed. Any one is a correct score. Three, Socrates was a merry fellow, never petty or unkind. Four, he was in four battles, a hero and a foot soldier. Five, why was the word Socrates used most? Six, his enemies called him a crackpot and a corrupter, a meddlesome, sardonic prattler. Count yourself right if you had any one of these. Seven, Socrates allegedly violated the laws of impiety and treason. Eight, Socrates said about life, life unexamined is not worth living. Nine, he died from poison. He drank a cup of hemlock. Ten, Leo Rostin was the writer I quoted. Eleven, Socrates never wrote a word, according to historians. And 12, Plato called him the bravest, wisest, most just man of all we know. Well, how did you do? If you had as many as 10 correct answers, you're an excellent listener. If at least seven of your answers were right, you're above average. But if you got less than half of them right, it might be a good idea to increase your listening ability. In fact, all of us can profit by listening more closely. A well-trained pair of ears is one of our most valuable assets, and here's why. The experts estimate that most of us spend about 70% of our waking hours in some form of verbal communication. It breaks down this way. 9% of our time is spent writing, 16% is spent reading, 30% is devoted to talking, and 45%, almost half the time we're awake, is spent listening. So you see, it really is a good idea to know how to listen, how to get more good out of what we hear. While you've still got your pencil handy, you may like to make some notes on some ways to increase your listening power. The first suggestion is to recognize the importance of skillful listening. If we don't realize it's worthwhile to hear more of what people say to us, there's no reason to bother improving this creative power. Second, we should pay attention. Now, while this may seem too obvious even to mention, it's surprising how many people try to fake their attention, and it's awfully embarrassing when they get caught at it. While listening to someone, we should look at them squarely in the eye is always best and give them the attention and respect we appreciate so much when we're speaking. If instead of listening to a person, we're trying to figure out what we're going to say next, we can't possibly keep up with what that person is telling us. Third, we should keep alert to the speaker's gestures and facial expressions. Empathy is one of the outstanding marks of a good listener. None of us likes to talk with someone who persists in wearing a deadpan expression, so try smiling occasionally and nodding agreement. This tactic is just as positive as a yawn is negative. Fourth, we ought never to rule out any topic of discussion as totally uninteresting. Creative people are always on the lookout for new and different information. While we may rightly classify some topics as drivel, gossip being one candidate for this list, it's wise to be sure the subject is not worthwhile before tuning it out. Keep your mind open to new ideas. They're all around you, and many of them will come by way of the spoken word. Fifth, avoid prejudging the speaker. Pay attention to what he's saying rather than the way he says it. Closed-mindedness and jumping to conclusions might well come under this heading. An excellent example of prejudging and missing the point entirely occurred about a hundred years ago when a brilliant speech by Edward Everett, which lasted some two hours, was followed by another delivered by a gangling giant of a man who spoke only ten sentences. When he finished, there was a smattering of polite applause. But what that battlefield crowd had just listened to and not heard had dismissed completely because of the second speaker's brevity and awkward manner was the Gettysburg Address. Here's the sixth suggestion for increasing your listening power. Take brief notes while listening. 
When these are reviewed later, they jog the memory and bring back to mind the speaker's main points. Here again, you can see the value of keeping a pencil handy. Seventh, look for the speaker's purpose, what he's trying to get across. Search for his main ideas and distinguish facts from fiction. Eighth, we should beware of our emotional deaf spots that have a tendency to turn off our hearing. These are often words or ideas that strike us the wrong way. If we know of such deaf spots, we can begin removing them by defining the word or idea that's bothering us, analyzing the matter completely, and discussing it with a good friend or a member of the family. Once we realize that a situation like this exists, it's relatively simple to cure it. Ninth, be observant. Listen for areas of mutual interest and resist distractions. You know, while our minds can think at a speed of 500 words per minute, we normally talk at about 125 words a minute. There are three things we can do to keep our rapid thinking concentrated on what's being said. First, weigh and evaluate the material as we listen. Think more about it. Second, think ahead, anticipate the next area to be covered. And third, think back, recapitulate. A quick recap helps our memory. It greatly increases our retention of what we've been told. Tenth and finally, discuss the skill of listening with your business associates, your friends, and your family. By talking about things that are important to us, we reinforce and amplify our own understanding. Good listening pays high dividends in business, socially, and in our personal lives. Well, there they are. Ten suggestions to help you sharpen your listening skill. I hope you've made notes on them and that you put them to work for you from now on. And in summing up, you might like to remember the golden rule of listening. Always listen to others as you would like them to listen to you. As a bonus, it's amazing what this will do for your popularity with others. Good luck and happy listening.